Oh, hi. You caught me battling a bird -demic. Speaking of birds, let's talk about Birds of Prey writer Gail Simone. Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. I've got a question for you. What role does social media play in the lives of comic creators today? What role does it play in their success specifically? Well, for the person I'm going to talk about today, I'd say that role has been huge. I'd say that it has helped get her foot into the door of the industry. It has helped her get jobs, and it has helped her get jobs back that she was fired from. Uh, with the release of the new movie Birds of Prey, it got me thinking about one of the comic version's best known writers, Gail Simone. So today, I want to talk about the history of Gail Simone, I want to talk about a lot of her techniques across several different titles, and I want to ask the question, what role has social media played in her life? Let's get into it. Gail Simone was raised on a small dairy farm in Oregon, and according to interviews she's given, she had no nearby libraries or bookstores growing up. She was a relatively shy person who discovered a measure of confidence in herself when she caught a rerun of the 60s Batman show featuring Batgirl, who was a clever and capable crime fighter. She later found some comics at a yard sale and fell in love with the medium. Nevertheless, she did not pursue a career in comics, and after a few years at college, she started her own hairdressing salon. Along the way, she became active online in early forums. She co-founded the website Women in Refrigerators in 1999, which got her a lot of attention in the industry. The site was a list of female characters in comics who had been killed, raped, or maimed. It was named after a 1994 Green Lantern story point where Green Lantern Kyle Rayner returns to his apartment and finds a supervillain has killed his girlfriend Alexandra DeWitt and stuffed her in his refrigerator. Gail argued that comics disproportionately demolished female characters purely as a way to motivate the male heroes and felt that this was a comic trope. Is that actually a comic book trope? Well, obviously that's the kind of stuff I like to take a close look at, and I would argue that yes, it was a popular comic book trope in comics all the way up through the 90s, although there is some nuance there. The writer of that Green Lantern story, Ron Mars, argued that in comics, the supporting characters are often the ones to suffer consequences while the heroes soldier on. I think he's partially right. Up through the mid-90s, the vast majority of comics had male protagonists. The trope was perhaps more a case of the protagonist losing someone important to them, and by default, that often meant love interests. However, it is still a bit of a shortcut to create a character whose sole purpose is to be hurt or killed as part of a motivation for the protagonist. If the victims have no unique goals and personality, if they lack what writers would call agency, then that does become a trope. At the time the site was created, prominent heroes like Supergirl had been killed off, and Batgirl had been permanently disabled by the Joker. That kind of stuff would later happen to Superman and Batman, but they got better right away. It was a lot less common for female characters to return whole until more recent years. Anyway, the work that Gail did on that website got her a lot of attention in industry, and it actually brought her closer to working on comics. Gail began writing a weekly humor column for comic book resources called You'll All Be Sorry, and by 2000, she broke into comics, writing Simpsons stories for Bongo Comics. That humor background served Gail well, and she was soon given the reins to Deadpool at Marvel. Its sales were low at the time, but Marvel hired her to write a concluding story arc and to create a pseudo spin-off title called Agent X. She eventually left that title over a conflict with its editor, but was brought back to write the book's final arc. Gail was getting writing assignments because of her sense of humor, and she wasn't immediately pigeonholed in the industry as a woman that was only getting assignments to write female characters. That said, she was about to get approached to write a book about female characters that would go on to become one of her best-known works, 
when DC Comics approached her in 2003. Gail Simone took over writing Birds of Prey, starting with issue 56. The title had been written up to that point by Chuck Dixon, well known for writing action-based comics that didn't have a lot of superpowers in them like Punisher and Batman. It starred Barbara Gordon, formerly Batgirl, now known as Oracle, and Dinah Lance, the Black Canary. The duo would utilize Oracle's intelligence with Black Canary as a field agent to take down all sorts of criminals. When Gale took over, she added Huntress, another Gotham City-based vigilante who came from an organized crime family but had vowed to take them all down. What was great about adding the third character was it added more inherent conflict. Each of the characters wants to take down crime, but each of them have different personalities, something Simone helped etch into stone. Barbara has a photographic memory and an encyclopedic knowledge of a wide variety of subjects, but is also a bit more ruthless. Black Canary is incredibly tough and capable, but is the more idealistic of the two and often serves as the conscience of the team. Adding Huntress put in a wild card. The team now had more capability in the field, but Huntress was willing to cross lines the other two might not. She was also not as skilled socially. Canary and Oracle had been a team for a lot of stories before Huntress was added, so even though those two had different views, they had formed a well-oiled machine. Huntress and later other characters like Lady Blackhawk would help change up that dynamic. The one thing that became apparent during Gale's run on Birds of Prey was that she really understood who these characters were. They had flaws like lapses in judgment, but were dynamic and interesting. Fans loved the characters, and the characters came to love one another. Sales on the book rose slightly when Simone took over and held study her whole run, which is impressive when you consider the industry as a whole had relatively low sales, and the interest in female superheroes has always been lower than their male counterparts. Nevertheless, Birds of Prey remained a consistent top 100 seller when the best-selling titles of the time were still only netting about 100,000 copies. Gale became known not just for her humor, but for her believable dialogue and a great mix of action, drama, and comedy, weaving through each story with ease. A standout storyline is Sensei and Student. It involves Black Canary training with villain Lady Shiva to increase her skills, while the U.S. government wants to track down Oracle and try her for treason. Oracle is forced to turn to the Huntress for help. Birds of Prey flew under my radar when it was initially coming out. I later enjoyed Gail Simone's work on the DC title Secret Six and went back to read Birds of Prey. It is so much more fun than I was expecting. She's writing these really powerful and competent women, and that's contrasted with the cheesecake artwork of Ed Bennis. I'd initially written off Bennis as a clone of Jim Lee or Joe Matarera but he actually has very clear storytelling, and while his characters are certainly exaggerated and cartoony, they also have a lot of personality and are great at expressing themselves. There's lots of boobs and butt shots, but it really doesn't feel like it crosses a line into completely gratuitous, possibly because the characters themselves are written as smart and capable. One element I liked about Gale's run is she made the villain The Calculator a substantial threat and an ongoing nemesis. Calculator started out as a pretty goofy Batman villain who ran around with a big calculator on his chest, but he was updated during Identity Crisis to be a cunning tactician who was Oracle's equal with computers. The Birds of Prey would take cases for free, but Calculator would charge fellow supervillains $1,000 per question and help them plan major crimes and heists. Through the run, he becomes obsessed with learning Oracle's identity and ends up going off his medication and having a mental breakdown. It was a great dark side look at what could happen to Oracle without her friends surrounding her to help her make the right choices. Gale's consistent strong writing on Birds of Prey made her a pillar for DC Comics. They signed her to exclusives several times in a row. They gave her additional assignments writing titles like The All-New Adam, Action Comics with Superman, and one of my personal favorites, Secret Six. Secret Six is about six C-level supervillains, and yet it's utterly compelling. It's a great, great comic. She made Catman, who was a total doofus, a total nobody. 
she made him into somebody utterly compelling. Uh, that will honestly be something I'll have to do someday down the road as its own episode, Just Secret Six. But by 2007, she was uh, tasked by DC Comics with writing Wonder Woman, and she would go on to become the longest serving female writer on that title. Gail stepped down from Birds of Prey and began writing Wonder Woman. The Wonder Woman run featured another great villain who was a dark reflection of the hero. Ares, the god of war, had created a new monster genocide, but the real conflict lies in the character Achilles, created by the Olympian gods just as they created Wonder Woman, but with a dictate to lead the Amazons so that when the gods return, everything is in order for them. Achilles is not a flat-out evil being and tries to make the right choices, but is too beholden to his masters, whereas Wonder Woman is independent, and it gives her a better overall perspective. The run has some great artwork, and also some really fun moments, like Wonder Woman fighting a guerrilla army. One weakness, which to varying degrees is found in all of Simone's titles, is a pretty weak romantic subplot. Simone creates believable characters, friendships, and conflicts, but her romances are pretty boilerplate in my opinion. In 2010, Gail moved on from Wonder Woman and also began writing a rebooted Birds of Prey series with her original artist, Ed Bennis. In 2011, Simone began co-writing a Firestorm series with artist and co-writer Ethan Van Skyver. In 2018, Van Skyver had become effectively blacklisted from Marvel and DC and released a scathing video talking about his time on the book with Gale. But Gale has always maintained an active presence online and addresses attacks head on. She released counterclaims that she believes the two had been good friends during the run and that she remembers her time very differently. Is using social media like this a wise move? I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, these days, a creator seems to need to use social media to promote themselves and their work. It seems like a necessary component to engage readers. I don't think that creators should respond to art critiques. But if it's a personal attack, I do understand the desire to put your side of things out there. In reality, what happens though? That often will rile up your fan base. And then things become unwieldy, to say the least. Uh, if you've got two sides riling up their fan bases, they're going to go after each other. And I put this to you. Does a creator have a responsibility to attempt to control their fans? Can you even do that? That's my question for you. Let's move on. In 2011, DC rebooted their comics, and it was decided by the editors that Barbara Gordon would return as Batgirl. Eventually, they were able to convince Gail Simone to return to writing this character for a third time. Gail was initially hesitant because Oracle had become a popular character and one of the few in comics to live with a disability. Gail came up with a story that involved Barbara being able to use her legs again, but she now deals with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of the Joker's assault. There's an ongoing debate about whether this was the right move, but ultimately, it was out of Gail's hands that Batgirl would be returning, and her run was successful. So it was a surprise when news broke on November 30th, 2012, that Gail would be leaving the title. For over a week, readers were left wondering why the run would come to such an abrupt end. And here's where Gail used social media once again. She posted to Twitter on December 9th that she had not resigned, but that a new editor, Brian Cunningham, had just been assigned the title and he'd taken her off of it. When readers found out about the news, they were up in arms. By December 21st, it was announced that she would be back on the book. Now that's a strong argument to be made for the power of social media. Uh, getting yourself reinstated on a title that you'd been taken off of. You have to imagine that even 20 years ago, uh, if a creator was removed from a book, we the fans would never hear about it again or understand why until, you know, maybe years later at some sort of convention panel. Gail Simone has been named one of the best tweeters in comics by IGN. She regularly gets new hashtags trending and even engages national brands. 
Her online presence connects her directly to her readers in a way that was never available to creators of the previous generations. It's helped her get and get back assignments and kept her an in-demand writer across publishers from Marvel to DC to Dynamite to Image. Since 2013, Gail Simone has maintained a regular presence working for every major publisher out there. She has written Red Sonja for Dynamite through 2017. In 2018, she was named the creative director for Lion Forge's new superhero universe. Uh, if you're curious where to start with some of Gail Simone's writing, uh, I would strongly recommend Secret Six, specifically with the Villains United miniseries, and of course Birds of Prey is also a really strong highlight for her. Um, aside from that, I can just say that Gail has an ear for dialogue, and you're going to know pretty quickly whether you like it or not, but no matter where you stand, you have to admit that her characters sound different from one another. They have distinct voices. That's something she's very talented at. Uh, if you like action and humor, you could do a lot worse than checking out one of the dominant female voices in comics. All right. I'm going to show us real quick what fan art came into the channel, and then I'm going to close out with a few more thoughts. Vilal Pando returns with artwork that shows us all that the Marvel superheroes don't appreciate how long I've ignored them. Check out more of his art on Instagram. Artist Daniel Thies sent in this artwork inspired by the recent episode contrasting Doomsday Clock with Watchmen. Lemurious Project from Greece created some artwork featuring me as Aquaman. You can find more of his artwork on Instagram. Here's a unique piece. This guy goes by Exploding Pages, and he's decided to cosplay as me with a list of tropes. Don runs a comics discussion group, and you can see more by checking him out on Twitter and Facebook. The Sad Panda illustrated myself and Infotron looking as cool as we've ever looked. Lou Petty sent in some art where I'm talking about some of the characters he created in his book Little Ruth Ann's Rainbow Color Correction Glasses, which is available on Amazon. Here's a cartoon by Deb Wolf involving me and some famous fictional characters having trouble with our food. This artwork features me as a pretty famous cyborg. Noah Legrand sent this in and includes a link to his Instagram. Will Adkins created a cool portrait and includes his Twitter and his Instagram profiles. Finally, Timothy Ball sent in artwork based on me in my Deadpool suit sucking down gross novelty sodas. Folks, if you'd like to have artwork featured on this channel, I'm happy to do so as long as it has something to do with comic tropes specifically. Just send it in to this email address, comictropes at gmail.com. I will include it, and then I'm going to shake up all the entrants. Every time I get 10, I will feature them, and I will pick one of them to win a Gachapon prize out of the Gacha Pony machine that was donated by Lunar Shine Store. Let's just bobble this all around so I have no idea what number is going to come out here and pick a winner. This week it is number two. Number two. So that's uh, this artwork. And now let's pick you a prize. Let me just close this up. Um, wow. This past week, actually this past two weeks, has been amazing for this channel. Folks, we ended up getting just so many subscribers. It was it was crazy. Um, okay, you know what? I don't know what's in this gachapon. Real quick, I'm just going to interrupt and uh, open it up so that we can see. Oh! <laughs> so this is going to be tough because it won't really focus on things that I put like too close to the camera. <laughs> this is a guy doing what they call in Japan kancho. Um, it's this super immature game where kids will put their hands together like this and try to poke someone in the butthole. So this is an action figure doing that. Uh, I will send that your way. But uh, back to just real quickly talking about the growth uh, the channel had. Who would have ever expected that my most popular video of all time would be about an inker from the 60s and 70s? I certainly wouldn't have guessed that. Um, I put the same amount of work and pride into all my episodes, so I'm definitely enthusiastic to see that uh, the community responded in such a big way and the channel really got a lot of explosive growth. Um, 
We are very close to crossing 100,000 subscribers and getting one of those coveted YouTube play buttons, which uh, I believe you can trade in for a free coffee somewhere. I, I don't know where. Somebody will have to tell me. But um, anyway, I just want to say welcome to all the new viewers. Thank you very much for the support. I sincerely appreciate it. Please remember to hit like and subscribe. I know that's cliche, but sometimes I have to remind people. Um, so anyway, if you haven't done that, I appreciate it. Uh, I've got some really exciting topics coming up. It was a little intimidating to do a follow-up video when that for, that one from the previous episode exploded to such a degree because I'm like, oh man, is my idea good enough for a follow-up? And then I started saying, you know what? The show is what it is. Uh, I'm not going to change it. So yeah, I'm going to stay with my original idea. I'd wanted to talk about Gail Simone. Um, the movie Birds of Prey did not seem to do very well at the theaters. Um, not well at all. But I went and saw it out of curiosity. I'll see most comic book movies out of at least curiosity. I liked it. I wouldn't say it was excellent, but I'd say it's damn entertaining. It's, it's got the same sort of humor that Deadpool has with action that reminded me a lot of John Wick. The action was really well staged, like really good choreographed action. So I ended up liking it quite a bit more than I expected. I went in with pretty average expectations, and they were slightly better than that. It, it, it slightly eclipsed that. But I think that part of the reason it's not doing well is, um, well, the last movie, Suicide Squad, to feature Harley Quinn, I don't think that was a very good movie. I think that burned a lot of people out. And it had a terrible marketing campaign. As somebody who has studied marketing for my degree, and that's my background, that title was long and unwieldy, and the outfits didn't necessarily scream comic books. Uh, I think that the marketing campaign was quite bad, honestly. Those are just some of my thoughts. But all I can say is, if it's out there, yeah, I'd definitely say it's worth catching a matinee. It's pretty darn entertaining. Anyway, um, that was a lot of rambling. I do like Gail Simone's work quite a bit. My favorite is definitely Secret Six. Secret Six was just sort of like, it came out of nowhere for me. And I was like, because I've always been uh, kind of like... Um, a lukewarm DC Comics fan. I, I like certain characters quite a bit, like Batman uh, and Superman to, to a lesser extent, but after that, I, I'm not always I'm not always a huge fan of DC Comics. Secret Six came out and surprised me. I would definitely recommend it. I appreciate you watching. I've got some cool topics coming up. Till next time, keep reading comics.